welcome to Stop Now, where we stop, listen, and share. Today's guest is going to be Mr. Carl Berry from the Community Care uh, Resource Council. How are you doing, Carl? I'm doing well. Good night. What about you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for joining us. And of course, we have the man behind the mask, JK. How you doing, JK? I'm good, Nate. And it's been a long, uh, I'm so happy to meet Paul. Uh, let's focus on our uh, special guest. Uh, Paul, how are you doing? And you can see like uh, Black Nate has become white. Did you notice it? Oh, I did. So what's going on? I uh, just uh, it's been very explosive. The nonprofit has grown tremendously. Uh, this is the third podcast I've done this week. I, I left a prison ministry meeting this morning uh, with a national organization that's worked in five cities uh, dealing with the families of those that are justice impacted. So it's been uh, very fruitful, very a uh, lot of growth, a lot of opportunity. So I'm not complaining. I'm enjoying it. For the viewers who aren't uh, yet familiar with you, would you give us a summary of what Community Care Resource Council does? Sure. Uh, Community Care Resource Council is an organization founded on awareness. Uh, most people, when they encounter a challenge in their life, don't know where to go to find the help. And even the people that provide help don't know where to find them. And so we basically help people find help. We provide them a list of resources. We have 20 uh, pillars, uh, Mr. Rubin, where it could be homelessness, it could be uh, ex-offenders, it could be mental health, it could be uh, digital desert, it could be HIV, could be autism, uh, could be substance use. We've got uh, diabetes, wound care, health care, the seniors, children, the list goes on and on. So what we do simply is just help people find help and then we have what we call resource providers, even people such as yourself, people that believe in helping community and working with others. And for those people, we provide them with digital marketing, with uh, graphic design, with videography, uh, with geofencing and geotargeting. So anybody we encounter is a person that will benefit from the services that we provide. We either help the end user that's seeking help or the resource provider that's seeking exposure. That's great. Uh, and what have you guys been up to since the last time that uh, you were on the Stop Now Daily Show? Well, like, like I said earlier, I have actually uh, with an organization uh, called Angel Tree. Angel Tree is a prison ministry that deals with the families of justice impacted individuals. And so uh, they had a sports camp this morning and the kids whose moms or dads or both are incarcerated uh, had a play date. They had uh, cowboys uh, uh, on site that they got to hang out with the sports figures. Uh, they had uh, what they divided people up into three groups, the kids, the caregivers, and then the institutions that support them. The organization came to us because the preponderance of the support is from somebody's church organization. It could be any church, Hindus, uh, Jews, whatever your belief system might be. And those systems are impacted due to COVID. A lot of organizations have folded or gone under and even the base that supports these organizations is smaller. So consequently, they're having financial challenges and they ask us to come in and help 
build awareness, help grow their base, help return people uh, to dealing with the benevolence issues. And we like to think of ourselves as uh, Nate, benevolence on steroids, uh, because a lot of times when you're trying to help people, you encounter people, frankly, running scams. And the people and the organizations that are uh, adept and know how to vet the person in need from the person that's trying to just scam you, uh, they already know how to handle that. So it keeps organizations from funding false uh, requests and now they can use their money to pay electric bills or pay other uh, sources that will continue to help people. Well, what would you say is the uh, the biggest uh, root cause uh, for the issues that uh, your organization uh, aims to solve? Um, what, what you, silos. What... We are full of silos. The world is full of silos. Everybody has an opinion. Most of the people with uh, diverse opinions do not talk to each other. And a lot of times people will have adversity in their hearts for trying to help people rather than to try to fix their needs. And so what we tend to try to do is to bridge the gap uh, between the needs of people and the uh, prejudices that people have. Uh, I often uh, deal with uh, 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 people that believe in a, a supreme dealing and people that don't. But either or, the question becomes, does mankind deserve help. If the, if the tornado hits, if the hurricane hits, if the volcano explodes, do you want to be there to help the people or do you want to let them suffer because they don't think like you do? And so for me, to answer your question, I think that we spend too much time uh, dealing with our differences. And as far as I'm concerned, the church is not going to fix it. The government's not going to fix it unless we as human beings unite and try to help one another uh, we're going to continue to have diverse problems on the planet. That's a very good answer. So if you were speaking to an individual who was troubled, uh, maybe somebody who was uh, abusing drugs or somebody who was committing crimes, uh, what, uh, what exactly would you try to say to that person? Frankly, uh, people don't care how much you know until they don't know how much you care. So I'm not going to try to analyze that person, nor am I going to try to correct their thinking. What I'm going to try to do is convey my sin and sincere and genuine care about them. What a lot of people don't realize is that there's a term in the psychological world called ACES. It's an acronym. It stands for Adverse childhood experiences. You find that people with drugs, people with mental health, people that commit crimes are generally the product of an environment as a kid where they experienced trauma. They had a justice impacted parent or the parent would ridicule them and says, you're not gonna grow up to be anything or the parent was into uh, substance use themselves or they were uh, extremely abusive, uh, extremely neglective. Uh, I work with organizations, one of which is the state of Texas, had me train 8,000 people that were in foster care or adoption. And we find out that a lot of times people that have heart attacks, people that have strokes, people that are using drugs, it stems all the way back to trauma that they experienced as a child. And so what I do is I try to ask people, uh, what is their history? What is their background? Uh, what can I do to help you? What keeps you up at night? And to genuinely try to uh, convey to them that I care uh, and not try to, to change the way they think or believe. So I talk to 
a person that's religious uh, or a person that's not religious. I'm not going to try to change their perspective or what they believe. All I'm going to do is try to convince them all I want to do is help them any way I can. And uh, how receptive do you feel that uh, people who are in these situations are to receiving uh, this type of help? Uh, most of the people that are in challenging sister situations are receptive if they believe you're genuine. Uh, what they're going to do is they're going to be on guard based on your approach. And what they don't want is somebody that's going to lecture them or somebody that's going to try to psycho uh, analyze them or somebody that's going to try to tell them what they need to do. What they look for is somebody more that will ask them questions about who they are and most importantly, share with that person who you are. And once they can feel like you're telling them the truth about yourselves, a lot of times people will accept you, even if they don't agree who you are. As long as they believe you're telling them the truth, uh, people are happy. Again, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Do you think that... Uh substance abuse is uh, something because um, I've heard in some in some areas that substance abuse can actually be considered a disease or you know uh, ingrained in a person's personality and uh, that the, the addictive personality is, not necessarily something that can be changed, but something that can be changed into being addicted to something else. Like, uh, for example, somebody who's addicted to substances might stop doing substances and become very, uh, very into, say, running or something like that instead. Uh, do you think that that's true or do you think that that's false? No, it's very much true. Uh, I I believe in the disease concept, but I you have to first design, define the word. And the word is dis-ease. So first of all, people that are uh, addicted to whatever it might be, uh, they're at dis-ease because they've been affected by a substance, by a circumstance, by a surroundings, or by a group of people. And what they learn is uh, habitual. It only takes 90 days to create a habit. So if you do anything for 90 days, you're going to end up with some sort of a habitual practice. Um, it's not as much uh, willpower. You know, there was a presidential, a wife of a president in the past. She used to say, i um, talking about drugs, just say no. Well, that was uh, kind of a laughing stock to people that were addicts because there is a chemical imbalance uh, it's called dopamine, serotonin. Uh, there's certain things in your brain that are addictive, uh, even the uh, opposite sex. There's certain things you see a certain kind of a person, and it's your flavor. Uh, what happens is your brain releases a chemical, and the chemical is what's making you think, man, she's hot, he's hot. Well, that's just a chemical release in the brain. Your brain is the greatest chemical processor that exists. And so that's why a lot of times when people have mental health issues, uh, they talk about it as being bipolar or, or having a brain or a chemical imbalance in the brain. And so uh, drugs actually releases serotonin. So if you do a certain kind of drug, you're going to actually... Uh, release dopamine in your system. That's why they call it dope, because you're releasing dopamine in your system, and all of a sudden, guess what? Your brain wants more. Uh, the greatest dope on the planet, what do you think the most uh, horrendous drug on the planet is? What do you think the most powerful drug there is is? 
when you take a like, like, like a I think that you're gonna say that a naturally occurring something in your body is the most <laughs> is, uh, okay. Meaning well, it does occur naturally in the body, but the, the greatest drug on planet Earth is sugar. Whenever you eat sugar, what's the first thing you want afterwards? More sugar. You eat an ice cream cone or chocolate malt or a sundae, the first thing you want is another cookie. You know, you had a cookie, you want another cookie. 80% of what's on the shelf in most grocery stores today, not Whole Foods stores, but just traditional commercial grocery stores, 80% of it has some form of sugar. They call it fructose and glucose and all sorts of different things. But 80% of what they sell to you is sugar. And in fact, it, it, it is something that uh, is all of our soft drinks, most of them. And it's something that causes a craving and, and it's something that's considered to be legal, but it is a substance in my mind. And do you think that there's a correlation between this sugar consumption and addictive personalities? I, F, uh, absolutely. But the, the, the true uh, thing to concern is, and I, I hate conspiracy theories, but the true... Uh, detriment to the planet is generally monetary. Uh, everybody is trying to get over and to get a dime or a dollar. And most of the what motivates uh, society is money related. They give it fancy and really wholesome sounding words like a lobbyist. But what is a lobbyist but somebody that's paid to go to the people that make the laws and try to influence them to vote like they want them to vote? And the reason they want them to vote like they want them to vote because they got money tied up in the decisions that the lawmakers make. And so we live in a society uh, that money is, in my mind, the definition of the root of evil because everybody gets caught up in monetary, we look at slavery and you've got slavery, history of slavery all over the world by myriads and plethoras of people, but it was always about diamonds, it was about sugar, it was about oil, it was about something that had a financial value. And, and, and this world is still run by people that are trying to get the money. Well, uh, Carl, uh, I've been listening and I don't know how I got addicted to your personality. And do you know that like you are the uh, highest grossing uh, special guest in our uh, talk shows? You keep coming in. So I just wanted to reduce my addiction. So that's why I'm distancing myself from you. So you are so uh, passionate in uh, these uh, expressions. Uh, my... Uh, question to you call right so the thing is for me like money is more of trust right so it's like how does that becomes broken that is the reason like with all these conflicts uh, can you tell us something more about any recent news or articles that is kind of uh, impacting your uh, thought process how humanity is going to approach those things let's say for well, example well i can share with you the history of man and it's really more historic i think than uh, present but i can tell you with your addiction all you got to do is uh, hang out with my wife about a day or two and she has lost her addiction to carl so you you're okay if you just figure out what motivates her but i want to take um uh, i just uh, did a program with some Hindu friends of mine in the temple here in Dallas. They had a holiday. There were 10,000 of them there. They asked me to come and bring some people with me to share the story of Black, Black history. And one of the things I told them about Black history was is that the people showed up with white robes and crosses. 
we're going to take your kids and we're going to make them doctors and lawyers and send them back to the village. And yes, it was about trust. And so they took the kids and they sent them away, but they never came back until they discovered the same people in the same garb in another village 60 miles away. And when they recognized them, they said, what happens to our kids? Uh, the, the people uh, the, uh, uh, in Africa that were armed with spears, but the people wearing the black robes had guns under their robes. And so it was the trust that they instilled into them that caused the problem. And the reason I bring that story up, it was very much the same with my Indian brothers uh, among this Hindu temple. Uh, for them, it was gold and, and it was still slavery and it was still about money. And then we can talk about people that go, uh, I think back in history, I think about the Crusades, people that got this cross, they got on their horse, they put on uh, armor, and they rode all across Europe and Asia, uh, actually collecting all of the spices and all of the valuable uh, artifacts that were valuable to man. And again, they were doing it making out like it was about trying to help people, but what they were really trying to do was help themselves to the money. So there's a word that I use, JK, to answer your question. I'm vigilant. The first thing I do when I meet somebody that tells me uh, that they care about me and they want to try to help me, I become watchful. Vigilance means watchful. And I try to see if their feet match their tongue. Uh, because a lot of times people will uh, identify who they really are if you just watch them and pay attention. And sometimes uh, I use a, uh, a th I grew up in the inner city, in the ghetto. And one of the things we had when we were little kids, they taught us how to play the nut row. The nut row meant you played crazy. All you need to do is convince somebody that you're not very intelligent and then watch how they try to come at you and watch the traps that they set for you. I was a using drug addict. I used to steal people's drugs and then help them look for it. And so these are the kind of things that I think we have to look at in society. Look at the genuineness of people. Look at, are we trying to help? Or are we trying to help ourselves? And I think that that's part of the source of, of addiction. That's personal opinion. Well, Nate, uh, you are stumbling or you are stuck with the answers. <laughs> Do you want me to go? Uh, on? It's, a, it's, a, it's a wide ranging answer. I'm still processing. If you... If you want to, if you have a question that you want to ask, please jump in. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Carl, uh, I'm getting at this kind of, so are we close to finding a solution to this human problem by trusting the missions? Like, uh, I mean, the AI, can it provide us the trust we can look for? replacing humankind? I would say yes, uh, because I've been dealing with that. And the way that I deal with it is to be genuine. And what I find is most healing, I call involvement. Uh, I've got a friend of mine from uh, the islands. He's uh, uh, from Haiti. And we've got another friend that is from Mexico. And the three of us went and hit golf balls one day. None of us can play golf. None of us hit the ball very well. But we were able just to share our childhood, share uh, similarities and the differences. Uh, I believe in involvement. I believe that most people think they're different from people, and most people don't even have a genuine definition of culture. 
Some people think of culture as a language or skin color or ethnicity or religion. And yes, it is some of that. But uh, culture is also education. It's uh, socioeconomic. Uh, the, the, the poor kids don't like to go to the rich kids' house because the kids, rich kids got swimming pools. And the poor kids feel less than when they go to the house. They don't want to even get in the field, swimming pool because they don't have a swimming pool. So we've got to understand that I grew up in a neighborhood uh, that was the black kids in my neighborhood looked at me because I have a light complexion and they said I was white and I had curly hair. The white kids looked at me and they said I was black and I had nappy, nappy hair. And the Spanish people looked at me and said I was uh, a Mexi I was a, a traitor to the Mexican race because I couldn't speak Spanish, but I'm not Spanish uh, in authentic, authentic, authenticity. The, so the point I'm trying to make is we look, have to look at people at who we really are, not who we think they are, and then come to an understanding of what are similar about us and what's different about us. And we need to start with things pretty simple. Like most people like their mama. You know, it's got to go back that root cause of caring uh, for one another, caring for families, caring for the people in the next silo over. You know, uh, I, 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 I particularly uh, use politics as an example. Uh, 50 years ago, when one politician said something negative about another one, they called it uh they called it mudslinging. Now today, uh, that is considered to be the mode of operation. I hear politicians all the time calling each other idiots and fools and crooks. And all of these kind of things that basically continue to divide us are the things that are not going to work. But I have my faith and hope in fellow man because I see people coming together my Hindu friends taught me something this last week. I had a rent award that they gave me a little silver bowl and a spoon to go with it. But they shared with me the a, a philosophy they lived by. And that philosophy was uh, humanity, serving humanity is divinity. And all they were saying is caring about my fellow man is a good and wholesome thing. And I think that that's where we're at. I think we're starting to see that we got more in common than we do in our differences. And we don't need to celebrate our differences as much as we need just to learn how to celebrate and appreciate one another. Well, that's wonderful. Again, uh, I'm still uh, struggling to understand how you put up with this community care resource council helping people because we found it's so hard like to help people uh, and make them to trust us. Uh, similar to what you said, like one of our victim from Dallas, uh, he shared a story like uh, being uh, uh, from the Indian origin and he is trapped into the modern slavery and he feels that he is a victim and he needs to get justice. But then when we try to provide solution or the direction in which he can get the help, he refused to get it. So he uh, he is comfortable being in the system and with this employer and being trapped in the victimization. What do you have to say to that call? So when have you heard the story about the guy that was helping the starfish on the beach? You know, there were starfish, the beach was full of starfish. And there was a guy coming along and he'd pick up a starfish and throw him back in the ocean. And the guy watching him says, look, man, there's starfish everywhere. You're sitting up here throwing them back in the beach, but you're not going to help all these starfish. And it, it doesn't make a difference. And the guy picked up another starfish, threw him in the water, and he says, it, but it makes a difference to that one. You're not going to help everyone but you help those that you can in confidence and faith that through helping others, you're gonna learn how to continue to help others. 
Uh, one of the things that I have to do in what I do is develop what they call an elevator speech. I just pulled my elevator speech up. It took me four years to get my ele speech, elevator speech down to where people could understand it. Even my board members that were part of the organization really didn't understand what we did. But here's what I came up with. When you call CCRC, help is on the way. We're about connecting people in need with the resources they need to get back on their feet and lead better lives. We love helping people find help. Uh, we have a life management referral assistance program that connects people and organizations to the government, faith, and healthcare resources best qualified to meet their need. And that's all we do. We try to help people find help. We do not do it for them. Let me repeat, we don't do it for them. People need to have skin in the game. So your friend that doesn't want to do anything, you can't help him until he does. And the thing we I do is that I, I you call me and you say, I can't pay my electric bill. Well, I go and I talk to the government. I talk to the faith and behavioral health people. I get a list of people that do assist people with electric bill. I send you that list via text or email. I tell you, these people will help you pay your bill, but you've got to call them this yourself. If you don't call them yourself, then just sit there in the dark. I can't help you. And that's the problem we have. We've become so lazy on this planet that most people don't even want to go to the computer and look for help. Frankly, the help resources we have, all we really do is get on the computer with keywords and search for it. Uh, help paying electric bill, and you'll find it. So all we do is try to help people find help. And through that, finding people that help themselves is what leads us closer to the solution. Because once they learn that, hey, I can do something about this, this guy that you says, uh, wants to just stay there and suffer, you know, I don't try to talk them out of it. I just say, well, if you'll enjoy it like that, that's real good. I had a guy tell, tell me this morning, I got all this extra time now, but I still can't find time to call you for help. And I said, okay, well, you got extra time, but you can't call me for help. Where's the problem? Who is the problem? And a lot of times we got to understand that most of Carl's problem, you know who causes Carl the most problem? This idiot named Carl. Most of my problems are self-inflicted. Most of my problems are because I come up with a good idea. And so the things I got to do is I got to tell you how I feel, how I think, how I feel about you, and then be open-minded. And the open-mindedness is my favorite word. I don't know, JK, if I had this word, but now I have a favorite word. My favorite word is maybe. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're wrong. Maybe you got a point. Maybe you don't. But as long as I'm stuck on maybe, as long as I'm in the middle and I'm not extremely left or extremely right, I have the ability to change my perspective and my belief system. And maybe to me has what allowed me to get some balance in trying to approach those people that uh, I tend to think I'm, I disagree with. I find out I really don't disagree with as many people as I, I agree with. Uh, they, they have a perspective and maybe they're right. <laughs> One of the most common problems that uh, stop now um, that, that, that victims of H1B visa abuse uh, face is uh, being afraid to speak up, being afraid of the consequences of speaking up. And maybe a part of that is just the fear of change and just the, the resistance that uh, many people have to the idea of starting to begin uh, to live in a different way and for their situation their life situation to, to be very different than it is that there's some uh, natural resistance to that in people. And uh, how, 
how does your organization uh, address this or what would you say about this? Well, there are two theories that Nate, I deal with with that. And, and I try to break it down to the most common level so that people can uh, not disagree. And with addicts, one of the things I talk about is the rusty nail syndrome. I'm sitting on a bench and I've been sitting on this rusty nail for 10 years now. And it's dangerous. It is gangrenous. It can influence my blood system to the point where it could kill me. And it's painful. But I have learned to sit on this rusty nail in a manner that if I sit just right and I position myself just right, I can be comfortable sitting on this rusty nail. But if I were to get off, off of this nail and go find another place on the same bench without the nail, I'm not trusting if that's going to be a better move or not. You already told me that grass is greener on the other side, and that may be right, but it may not be. And so the rusty nail syndrome has allowed me to convince a lot of people that you have a hard time living life, but you've learned how to live your life on drugs, but you haven't been able to figure out how to live your life uh, off of drugs. And that's because you're focusing on the problem. You're focusing on the nail, but that's not the problem. Drugs is not the problem. The, the problem is learning how to find a new way to live. And as long as you're taking drugs, guess what? You can't find a new way to live. So you got to stop taking drugs long enough to try to search for a new way to live. And without the influence of a substance, you can actually discover some new things. But if you're under the influence, your discovery is going to be jaded. So th that's my uh, country philosophy. You know, I'm from, I live in the city, but I'm still a country boy at heart. Great answer. JK, is there anything else that uh, you want to ask Carl before we wrap things up? Uh, no, I think uh, that's an excellent way to put it. Uh, in his own style, he has given all that answers. And the, the final thing, again, call. So it's been bothering for our entire team as well. So that's something like I wanted to bring up to everyone, right, as you put it up. It is their own making. And even you know, some of our teammates, right, they don't understand and when we help them to get a job, right? So when they feel comfortable and they get the job, they don't look back. They just ignore us. And it's not, uh, I mean, uh, many people think that uh, charity is for free, right? So they get the help and they don't give back. So what do you have to say to them? Like, right, nobody cares to donate or nobody cares to give back or, it, not just in money, right, in monetary terms, but in terms of the time, the dedication. So we are even struggling to find uh, like lawyers, right, pro bono lawyers to help legal cases. So those kind of things, like anyone like who wants to even come on a talk show and talk for 30 minutes, an hour, they want to charge. And my time is valuable. I, I can't spend uh, anything to anyone. So that kind of approach is there, like, with everybody. So what do you have to say with that? We can conclude our uh, final thoughts. Well, my thought is that uh, history is repeats itself and history is reality. And the reality is it's those people that give have always gotten more. If you just study the history of any great man in any point in history, you're going to find that he may have started with nothing and he may have ended up with a whole lot. But when he got a whole lot, what he started doing was helping other people. And, and yeah, there's some that don't give back, but those that don't get back don't reap great benefits. If I look at the people that reap the great benefits, those are ones that always have a philanthropy. They have a, a donation. They have a foundation, they have something that gives to other people. 
And, and sometimes it's not millions and millions of dollars. Sometimes it's the little kid in the second grade uh, that comes to school with a dime and he buys his five of his friends some penny candy and saves it and he has five cents. It's those relationships that result out of the five people he gave candy to that's going to make a difference. And in the world, our value is in the relationships we have with others. That's my belief, and I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> that's wonderful. Beautifully put. Well said. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Carl. We really appreciate your time and your wisdom. Uh, it's been great talking to you and definitely hope to speak to you again soon. I always enjoy speaking to you guys and my friend JK in particular. Uh, he's always uh, makes me think. And he knows when he does, he's going to get honesty. Doesn't mean I'm right. I say, I don't. Being right ain't all it's cracked up to be anyway. I just have a perspective and I trust uh, my friends like JK and my new friend Nate enough to be honest with you and share what I think about. And then I, I know that since I have a maybe attitude, I need to listen to you because you might change my entire mind. Thank y'all. Have a great day. Thank you, Carl. Maybe. Thanks. You will. <laughs> <laughs>